see you here today. We are going to continue our, our Bible study on uh, the book of Nehemiah. I do want to encourage uh, many of you to sit as far back as you possibly can today. That'd be good. Wow. <laughs> I guess so. so. That's all right. That's all right. Larry is in the second row. The Hebs are in the second row. So they're, they're in the splash. You're in the third row. But uh, they're in the splash zone, so here we go. Um, but I'm glad you're here. Why don't we, uh, if you're able to, stand, and let's uh, get ready to praise the Lord together. And uh, we'll thank the Lord for all that he does today. Amen? So uh, why don't you join me in prayer. God, thanks for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord God, that you brought us here. And Lord, whether it be by... Uh, being here in person together, or maybe we're connecting online tonight. Uh, Lord, I ask you that you would just bless everybody, uh, regardless of who we are, as we dig into your word. Speak to us, I pray, through it, and, uh, and I'll give you praise for what's done. Uh, so we commit this time to you. Be blessed by our praise. In Jesus' name, and we all said amen. 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 Open up the skies of mercy and rain down your cleansing flood, healing waters rise around us. Hear our cries, Lord, let us rise. Open up the skies of mercy and rain down cleansing flood, healing waters rise around us and hear our cries Lord let them rise it's your kindness Lord leads to repentance your favor Lord it's our desire it's your beauty Lord makes us stand in silence your love, your love is better than life. We can feel. We can feel your mercy for them. You are turning hearts back again hear our praises rise to heaven and draw us near Lord meet us here it's your kindness Lord leads us to repentance your favor Lord is our desire it's your beauty Lord, makes us stand in silence. Your love, your love, it's your kindness. And it's your kindness, Lord, leads us to repentance. Your favor, Lord, is our desire. And it's your beauty, Lord. Makes us stand in silence And your love, your love Is better than life Better than
So I was going through songs today. I uh, found an old, old song, so it's, it's not new. It's old. But you might not know it, so we'll go through it and we'll teach it. It's just touched my heart the first time I heard it. Jesus, you are mercy. Jesus, you are justice. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. You died alone to save me. You rose so you could raise me. You did this all to make me chosen child of God. Jesus, you are mercy. Jesus, you are justice. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. You died alone to save me. You rose so you could raise me. You did this all to make me chosen child of God. And worthy is the Lamb that once was slain to receive all glory power and praise for with your blood you purchased us for god but jesus you are worthy that is what you are jesus you are mercy Jesus, you are justice. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. You died alone to save me. You rose so you could raise me. You did this all to make me chosen child of God. Worthy is the Lamb that once was slain. To receive all glory, power, and praise. For with your blood you purchased us for God. But Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. Perfect sacrifice, crushed by God for us. Bearing in your hurt All that I deserve Is judged for my misdeeds You suffered silently The only guiltless man In all of history And worthy is a lamb That once was slain to receive all glory, power, and praise. For with your blood you purchased us for God. But Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. Worthy. Oh, worthy is the Lamb that once was slain. To receive all glory, power, and praise. For with your blood you purchased us for God. But Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. Justice and mercy. Justice and mercy. Justice and mercy meet at your throne. Justice and mercy, justice and mercy, justice and mercy meet at your throne. Justice and mercy, justice and mercy, justice and mercy. At your throne, justice and mercy, justice and mercy, justice and mercy, be at your Love you, Lord. Oh. 
for your mercy never fails me and all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest nights you are close like no other i've known you as a father i've known you as a friend and i have lived in the goodness of god All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Let's sing that one more time with all my life all my life you have been faithful With all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Of the goodness of God. Lord, I thank you for that truth. There's not a moment that you have not been faithful. There's not a moment that you haven't had your eye on 
each one of us. Amen. Father, you desire the absolute best for us that would bring you glory in our lives. And Lord, that's what we want. We want to have that deep desire that with every breath, with every step, with every move, with every thought, with every action, that glory would be brought to the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, you have been faithful to us. You've been so faithful. You're a great God. And Lord, we just worship you tonight. We just lift up that magnificent name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. And sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art. And when I think that God is son not sparing, send him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great thou art! How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How how great thou art, how great thou art, and sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. So, Lord, we pray that uh, we pray today that you would.
personally show that greatness uh, in the lives of all that are joining today. Uh, whether that needs to be demonstrated by your provision, whether that needs to be demonstrated by your healing powers, whether that needs to be demonstrated by just bringing peace where there is a very difficult circumstance. Lord, I pray that you would just take that, uh, that, that greatness, that power, and, and all that you are, and God, that you would just move in those situations. So God, we pray for those that are facing uh, critical times. God, those that are facing circumstances, we, we just pray you be the glory and the lifter of our heads. And Lord, I'll thank you for what you do. I, I pray that every great answer would also be, uh, be followed up with a great testimony so that others can put their faith in you. So have your way, I pray, God. And we'll thank you. We'll give you praise. We'll give you glory and honor for all that you do. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we say all this, we pray all this, and we believe. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, before you're seated, why don't you welcome somebody here today? If they came after you, then uh, just heap condemnation on them. That's what we do here in church. And uh, that would be great. That's what we do. For some, it's a spiritual gift. <laughs> Okay, everybody, we want to welcome you to our Bible study for tonight. So whenever you're ready to find your way back to your seats, hopefully that's before Friday. Oh, you have no idea. You have no idea. All right. Hey, welcome, everybody. Glad you're here. It's a great crowd here today, and uh, we will... Uh, Try to get you out. What what time is the vice presidential debate today? Nine, oh, yeah. I'll have you. Out. I'll have you out of here by then, no problem. So, um, should be interesting. Uh, anyway, thanks for thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. Does anybody need notes for Nehemiah chapter nine? We're starting that just brand new today. So anybody need notes for tonight? We finished chapter 7 and 8 last week. So does anybody need 9? Someone's going to need it when I start. It's going to happen. Okay, anybody? Anybody? Oh, we made extra. Okay, and there's room for you. 
All right. The millions have come. There's still room for one. Okay, anyone? Okay. Some of you don't know that song, and that's a shame. All right. Nehemiah chapter 9. Well, let's pick up then where we left off, okay? Uh, here we were at this moment where most, if not all, of the construction on the wall and on the gates has been completed. And the people have gathered together. And in chapter 7, we have this massive listing of all these people. And then in chapter 8, there's this, there's this festival called the Feast of the Trumpets. And this was, this was a big, it, it was one of the big Jewish holidays. You know, like for us, it's Christmas and Easter, and then there's Arbor Day. Uh, for <laughs> just, just you know, if you're listening, okay, good. Um, uh, Feast of the Trumpets, this was a big Jewish holiday. And so all the people had gathered together, and this incredible move of God begins to take place, where as Ezra, the priest, is reading from what we have is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So he was reading the law, the scripture says. Uh, and those terms are used interchangeably. So whenever you see that, that's what it's referring to. Ezra's reading that, and there, there is spontaneous worship. There's spontaneous confession of sins going on. And there are other priests that are actually kind of getting people in clusters and they're explaining everything that Ezra is reading about. And there's just this huge move of God where there's just this uh, humility on their part. Humbleness maybe would be a better word. And, 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 and people are worshiping God and people are uh, just... Uh, confessing their sins and they're praying for one another and they they even get to a point where they they've noticed that for many years they have not uh celebrated the feast of the trumpets correctly uh because the feast of the trumpets also involved gathering a bunch of sticks uh branches if you will making like temporary shelters out of them and then living in those shelters and that hadn't been done for years and years and years and when the people heard that they said, we need to obey God to the letter. And so there was this incredible sense of, uh, of a desire to serve God, even when that type of obedience and service to God had not been demonstrated for quite some time. And that is basically how chapter 8 closed. This brings us now to chapter 9. And what happens is that the people decide that they want to get together again. Now, there's no festival. There's no Jewish holiday. But the people have this hunger for more. Okay? And so there is quite a lesson for us to learn, and there's quite an example to be uh, looked at here by the people of God. So having said all of that, if... Uh, if you want to look in your Bible, and if you don't have your Bible, I'll have all the scriptures on the screen. And those of you who are joining us online, I forgot to welcome everybody who's joining us online. Would you help me, in-person audience, to welcome all of our online people? And we're really, really glad you're here. And, uh, and, and we'll be able to flash all the scriptures on the screen as you watch it as well. But uh, I want to start with the first five verses of Nehemiah chapter 9. So follow along with me. I've got it in the New, Interna New International. It's easy for me to say. New International version here. It says, on the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and they confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. And they spent another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord their God. And standing on the stairs of the Levites were Jeshua and Bani and Kadmiel and Shebaniah, Bunai, Sherebiah, Bani and 
Ken and I, don't name your kids these names, folks. It just makes the baby dedications difficult. And they cried out with loud voices to the Lord their God. Verse 5 says, And the Levites, and there's all their names because I'm spent after reading those other ones. They said, and, and, and by the way, the Levites were the priests, right? So they were the, relig- they, they were the spiritual leaders of the people. The Levites said, Stand up and praise the Lord your God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. Okay? So some would say, and I think accurately so, that this revival had started. The spiritual renewal had taken place amongst the people after the completion of this building program, (laughs) after the completion of the building of this wall. And after the Feast of the Temples, the people uh, of the trumpets, sorry, the Feast of the Trumpets, the people wanted to get together and receive more and hear more and learn more. And that takes us to, let's go to that section in your notes on page one that says from feasting to fasting, okay? From feasting to fasting. Two days after the week-long festival concluded, another assembly was planned. This was not an official feast day, but the people came to worship and renew their commitment to the Lord. Number one, from this scene, it's evident that Ezra's daily reading has made a significant impact on the people. And again, in what way? In what way? Ezra is reading the book of the law out loud to everybody. Let's remember, not everybody found a Gideon's Bible in their hotel back then, okay? So they're hearing the word of the law, the the, the scriptures, if you will, being read by Ezra. What kind of an impact did it have on them? What are we reading here? What are we seeing? What was the impact of the reading of the word? Just shout out, spitball some answers at me here. They were excited. I like that. Praise. Repentance. Repentance. Good. What are some other things that took place? What's that? A revival. Good. What else? What else? They're hungry. There's a hunger. All these are great. All these are great descriptions. This is a sign of a genuine move of God in somebody and and amongst followers of Jesus Christ. Not only is there this excitement for the Lord, but there's this hunger for the things of God. But there's also this uh, recognition that sin needs to be dealt with as well. And and confession of sins takes place. And a real move of God, folks, is, is noted by what we have just rattled off here. That when, when God moves amongst a group of believers, it's not, necessarily, it's not necessarily demonstrated by people who jump higher or pray louder. Uh, and, and I'm not mocking that, I'm really not. Because I've seen that. But I've also seen very sinful people do that in church. So there has to be something a little bit deeper than, than that. Uh, because we could jump and we could shout, we could scream uh, normally at a football game <laughs> or a basketball game, or if your team wins. Uh, we can, man, uh, uh, sackcloth and ashes. I almost came in, I almost came in. I know, Hannah, welcome back from college. So, yes, I know, cowboys. Anyway, so, so we can get all those external re- responses. I love Hannah. We get, uh, just not today. We, 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 we can get all those external responses, and, and that's good, but that's not necessarily revival, okay? Revival is when you see these lives being changed first. It, it, it's, it's this inward move that takes place more than the outward expression, and, uh, and that's pretty powerful. And that's what we see with the people here. Take a look at uh, letter A. Fasting and sackcloth and dust on the head. Remember when we read that? Uh, those were outward signs of mourning and repentance. So it wasn't like a gimmick, you know, hey, everybody wore sackcloth, let's all match. Uh, that, that, that was actually a sign of uh, sorrow, brokenness, uh, all of that was a sign that there was uh, there's some serious things going on on the inside here. 
So today, if someone's serious about putting away sin in their life, how might they show it? Let's hear your responses. How, how might we show that? If we're serious about putting away sin, then how's that demonstrated? There's a brokenness, they're acknowledging it. Good. Fasting and prayer. Good. You run from it. Nice. Good. Say it again. Oh, surround yourself with the right people, if I can rephrase what you said. That's good, and that's important. Um, all these are good. Uh, there certainly needs to be a commitment to change, right? Um, anybody else get frustrated when a celebrity thinks they're Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the microphone? Because it's like, oh, okay, let's time them. How long, how long before they start spewing out something I really don't want a Christian to say? And, and I believe, and, and, and some of it's genuine, but some, some of it's awfully convenient. Um, you know, I know a UFC fighter that has a scripture tattooed on his chest. And, and this guy is just... <laughs> He's, that's just a dirt bag. If I could just, I won't say the name because now we're online. But uh, it, I'm thinking, ah, oh, have the tattoo removed for goodness sakes if you're going to do that. So, so there needs to be changed lives, right? Our, our, there needs to be a change in our conduct. Change in our conduct actually starts with a change in our heart. Change in our heart leads to a change in our mind, and that will lead to a change in our conduct. A lot of times, what do we do? We try to get it backwards, don't we? I want to be right with God, so I'm going to stop doing this, I'm going to stop doing this, I'm going to stop doing that. Well, it needs to be a little deeper than that because if the desires are still there, then all those things that you claim to be stopping, you might do well for a short season, but eventually, if there's no change on the inside for those things, then that's, that's only going to hold up so long. And so if we're saying, Jesus is my Lord, Jesus is my Savior, I'm confessing this sin to God, then what needs to take place then is not just a bunch of habits changing, but a lot of hearts changing as well, right? That's a sign of a, of a true... Uh, it needs to replace those things in your heart with the Word of God. See, that's just it. it, it th there's, and, and I say this a lot. The enemy only offers cheap imitations of what God uh, provides for us. All of his lies need to be replaced with the truth of the word. All of the, all of the temptations need to be replaced with the reality that what God offers is much better than that. Are we okay? <laughs> okay, good. So Ralph is dying, uh, but but we're gonna keep we're gonna keep on teaching. <laughs> so yeah, there there needs to be, and this is where a lot of Christians get it wrong. This is where a lot of people get it wrong because they'll get rid of stuff, but the, the now there's a vacuum there. <laughs> now there's a void, and you got to replace that with something that's healthy, spiritually good, spiritually healthy for you. Otherwise, that's going to get filled with something. And if you fill it with the Word of God, there's no room for the new stuff. Well, that's just it. When, when you fill it with the Word and the things of God, then there's no room for lies. There's no room for deception. There's no room for uh, giving in to temptation. Amen? Boy, this is really, really good. Really, really good. Let's look at number two. Rediscovering God in His Word was like a magnet for the people. Now, let's remember, these people had not been acquainted with the Word for many, many years, okay? So they're hearing the Word being read to them, okay? No, no fancy sermon, no points that start with the same letter. Ezra's just standing up there reading the Word, okay? And, and we're seeing this take place. Um, it was like a magnet for the people. The more they listened the more conscious they were of their sin and the Lord's faithfulness. Romans 2, 4, we just sang it. Uh, the kindness of God leads us to repentance. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. These verses are 
uh, these below are a small sample of all that Ezra read to the people. Um, Note what you see as evidence of God's kindness there. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. Uh, it says this, See, I have taught you declare, uh, degree, uh, bleh, decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I'm setting before you today? So what do we see here? We see a promise by God to be near the people, okay? We see uh, that the laws and the decrees and the commands that God set forth in his word, they were not an example of trying to beat people down, but it was actually an example of his kindness to the people. And that's what God's word is, by the way. Uh, Our culture will say that God's standards and God's law and God's word, well, that's just hate. That's just hateful. It's nothing could be further from the truth. The fact that God has set standards, and I will say even high standards, that he believes with his help we can reach, that is a sign of his love and his kindness to us not having his thumb over us and trying to domineer over us at all. Paula, way in the back. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So it's it's the same with you know the the laws what what Christ was set down for. He loved us. Yes. Yeah. Um, ever see that lazy parent in the store? You know, just won't correct the kid whatsoever. You know, and and I think the kid's name was Legion, maybe or or I, I'm not, but it's just awful. And so just no, stop your kid from like. Hitting people and, and, and throwing stuff. Oh, now, 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 now. And, and it's, wow. Um, God's laws are always for us. They're always for our betterment, for our good. Yeah. We, don't, we look at it the other way around as, as though they, he's going to whip us and beat us for some reason. It's not. All those laws are for our betterment. Even the ones we didn't, they didn't understand at the time. Yeah. 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 God had the goodness of the people in mind when he set forth his laws and his commands. And he still does. He still does. Um, let, let's look at some more scriptures here. Uh, same chapter, but starting in verse 27, uh, it says this The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and only a few of you will survive among the nations to which the Lord will drive you. There you will worship man-made gods of wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or eat or smell. But if from there, if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, then in later days you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. And he will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your ancestors, which he confirmed to them by an oath. What are we shown here again? We're shown God's mercy. 
What's that? Fatherly. A fatherly love. Unconditional, fatherly, gracious, merciful love is what we're showing here. Um, there's a promise not to abandon the people. There's a, pra- there's a promise to uh, not forget the covenants and the promises that he's made to the people. Um, this is where we really see the mercy of God here. And um, well, let me show you chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. It says, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God and to walk in obedience to him and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live, so that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land that he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lots of promises of blessing there, correct? Now, in my notes, I, I drew an arrow on the left of all three of those scriptures, and I wrote down the word, if. If. <laughs> See, because while God's love is unconditional, some of his promises are Conditional. If you do this, I will do that. Check out the if-then statements of God all through Scripture. The if-then promises. They're all over the Bible. In fact, I I just recorded a bunch of five minutes with Phil episodes today, and one of those dealt with the if-thens. How we want the blessings, but... uh, Or we want the thens, but we don't want to deal with the ifs. And God said, look, these blessings will come if you're faithful to me, if you're obedient to me, if you do what my word tells, if you do what I say that you should do. But if you choose not to do that, you're in trouble. And I'm going to tell you something. Please do not understand this. When he gives this negative command, when he says, if you do not obey me, if you do not do this, then this trouble is going to befall you. I don't think that's necessarily punishment from God. I firmly believe that when God outlines the way that we should go, then what he's doing is actually showing us the correct way to conduct our lives. And that's what keeps us safe. And that's what keeps us healthy. And that's what keeps us doing the correct thing. But when we sway from God's direction, then we have no choice but to see a mess of our lives because we haven't done it God's way. So I I don't know that I necessarily look at all this as divine punishment. Well, you know, if if I guess I didn't do this, so God punished me. (laughs) Well, no. Perhaps the fact that you have been trying to do things your way instead of God's way is creating all this crazy in your life right now. Uh, You know, a woman leaves her husband to try to find some guy she met on the internet. Okay, your life's going to be a mess if you pursue that. It is. It's not God's way. It's not. Well, you know, I'm just going to, you know, well, I won't give all the examples. You know what I'm saying. But when we do things God's way, God's blessing follows. When we do things the opposite of God's way, we are our own worst enemy is what we are. And, and we certainly don't need to blame the devil for everything that, quite frankly, we have caused ourselves. Is that too hard for a Wednesday night? That's truth. Okay, let's go to number three. See, I'm salty now because we, hit, we brought up the whole Cowboys thing. So now it just... 
so. Oh, and there's a brown shirt. Oh, well, at least you're close to the altar. All right, uh, <laughs> number three. <laughs> Look at number three. <laughs> okay, I think I've actually handled this pretty well. So uh, I've, I've gained 15 pounds from stress eating, but hey, it was a good cake. Uh, for three hours, the descendants of Israel stood and listened while the word of God was read aloud. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> they stood for three hours and they listened to a guy read to them. I mean, wow, I just can't fathom that. As a communicator, as a public speaker, wow, how times have changed, huh? I mean, my goodness, you know, I got PowerPoint and graphics and I'm lucky to keep you for 25 minutes. So anyway, but that, that was free. So they're listening while the word of God's being read aloud. Then for another three hours, they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. The word used here for confess means to acknowledge what is accurate and true. To acknowledge what is accurate and true. So there's two types of confession that I want to uncover in letters A and B. Okay, When we confess our sins, and look, this is what they did in verse 2. Verse 2, those of Israelite descent separated themselves from all the foreigners. They stood in their places and they confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. So when you confess your sin, you tell the truth about yourself. But when you confess God and when you worship him, you tell the truth about God. So confession will tell the real truth about yourself. Worship, true worship, will tell the truth. It will confess the truth about God. And that's why our, worship's in so, our worship is so important. That's why that time that we worship God collectively in a church service, that's why it's important. Because what we're doing is acknowledging and recognizing who God is. And we need an accurate view of who God is. In fact, I will even say that the more accurate your view of God, <laughs> the more accurate your view will be of yourself. And that can do nothing but lead you to confess your sin to the Lord and to make sure you're right with this glorious, wonderful God. Uh, Stan? I was thinking about Idol worship. I, I worship. Yeah. They, kept, they had a problem with it. God it continually had a problem with it. After this time, Israel never had a problem with idol worship again. Because they realized, they said, this is what we did. This is what, as a nation, we did this. And look what it's gotten to us. So now they, they confess their own sins, what yeah. they did. But they confess what their ancestors had done and seen how it had destroyed them. And never again did they have that problem. There is this incredible cycle <laughs> of the people of God, of, of the Jews, of, 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 of the Israelites, where they are doing great with God, and then they do exactly what Stan said. They, they fall prey to idol worship, or, or uh, typically it was idol worship, and then they're are these lingering effects of allowing that in to their community and into their people and into their lives. And then that would eventually be followed, sometimes longer than others, but it would eventually be followed by repentance. God forgives them, restores them, they're doing great, and then they do it all over again. But how many times do we do that? Right? Now, here's the thing. On that subject, uh, the, 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 the Levites, look, look at the section underneath uh, what happens when God's people pray, okay? Um, they, they are having this corporate time of confession and, and asking for forgiveness of sins and looking back at their ancestors and seeing what they had done and seeing the, the, the cycle, the death cycle, if you will, 
for so many of them. Uh, and then, verses 6 through 38, we have this history lesson of the people. Right here in the middle of this gathering, they have this lesson. Take a look at this. And, and bear with me as we read all these because you're going to see these stories one by one, over and over, over and over, over and over. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Some of us could fill our own personal lives with plenty of PowerPoint slides where it was over and over and over and over and over and over. So look at the people of God here. Uh, the, the, the Jews, they said, you alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry hosts, the earth and all that is on it, and the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you, and you made a covenant with him to give to his descendants the land of all these ites. It depends how you pronounce it, but all these ites, Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, etc. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. You saw the suffering of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. Here comes, okay, here comes the history lesson. You sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his officials and all the people of the land. You knew how arrogantly the Egyptians treated them. You made a name for yourself which remains to this day. You divided the sea before them so that they passed through it on dry ground. But you hurled their pursuers into the depths uh, like a stone into mighty waters. By day you led them with a pillar, a pillar of cloud, and by night with a pillar of fire to give them the light of the way that they were to take. You came down to Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and laws that are just and right and decrees and commands that are good. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and gave them commands, decrees, and laws through your servant Moses. In their hunger, you gave them bread from heaven, and in their thirst, you brought them water from the rock. You told them to go in and take possession of the land you had sworn with uplifted hand to give them. But they, our ancestors, became arrogant and stiff necked. They did not obey your commands. They refused to listen, and they failed to remember the miracles that you performed among them. They became stiff-necked, and in their rebellion, they appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. But you're a forgiving God. You're gracious. You're compassionate. You're slow to anger and abounding in love. Therefore, you did not desert them. Even when they cast for themselves an image of a calf and said, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt, or when they committed awful blasphemies, but because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. By day, the pillar of cloud did not fail to guide them or the, on their path, nor the pillar of fire by night to shine on the day that they were to take. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths, and you gave them water for their thirst. For 40 years, you sustained them in the desert. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet become swollen. You gave them kingdoms and nations, allotting to them even the, the remotest frontiers. They took over the country of Sihon, king of Heshbon, and the country of Og, king of Bashan. You, you made their children as numerous as the stars in the sky, and you brought them into the land that you told their parents to enter and possess. Their children went in and took possession of the land. You subdued before them the Canaanites who lived in their land, who gave the Canaanites into their hands along with their kings and the peoples of the land to deal with them as they pleased. They captured fortified cities and fertile land. They took possession of houses and they filled, filled with all kinds of good things, wells already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. They ate to the full and they were well nourished. They reveled in your great goodness. But they were disobedient, and they rebelled against you. They turned their backs on your law. They killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you, and they committed awful blasphemies. So you delivered them into the hands of their enemies who oppressed them. But when they were oppressed, they cried out to you, and from heaven you heard them. And in your great compassion, you gave them deliverers 
who rescued them from the hand of the enemies. But as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight. And then you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies that they ruled over them. And when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven. And in your compassion, you delivered them time after time. You warned them in order to turn them back to your law, but they became arrogant. They, did, they disobeyed your commands. They sinned against your ordinances, of which you said the person who obeys them will live by them. Stubbornly, they turned their backs on you, became stiff-necked, and they refused to listen. For many years, you were patient with them. By your spirit, you warned them through your prophets. Yet they paid no attention, so you gave them back into the hands of the neighboring peoples. But in your great mercy, you did not put an end to them and abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Now, therefore, our God, the great God, mighty and awesome, who keeps his covenant of love, do not, do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes. The hardship that has come on us and our kings and our leaders and our priests and our prophets and our ancestors and all your people from the days of the kings of Assyria until today, in all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. Our kings and our leaders and our priests and our ancestors did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or the statutes you warned them to keep. And even while they were in their kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them in the spacious and fertile land you gave them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. But see, we are slaves today. Slaves in the land that you gave our ancestors so that they could eat its fruit and the other good things it produces. But because of our sins... His abundant harvest goes to the kings that you've placed over us. And they rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are fixing their seals to it. This is all being confessed by all the people. Probably written out by Ezra. And there was this huge corporate confession of the history, the, the cycle. The cycle that went over and over and over again. Uh, letters A and B and C underneath number one. What did they recall? They recalled undeserved blessings. God still blessed them even when they didn't deserve it. And they recalled unrelenting love. Love that never, ever ended. Let me say this. God's love is not based on your conduct. God's love is not based on your conduct. He loves us regardless. That's, that's grace. That's mercy. That is not human love. Okay, Somebody acts wrong towards us, What's our flesh say? Uh-uh. Get away from me. We might even hate that person. But God, who is rich in mercy, demonstrated that to the people. And at this gathering now, as God has poured out his spirit, as Ezra simply read the word of God to them, there is this incredible confession and a recognition of where they'd gotten it wrong so many times and how God had always been right so many times. This is a powerful moment in the scripture. Powerful. It's not just a history lesson. It's so much more. It's people coming to grips with the fact that we need to quit doing things like this. We need to make a change. And started by confession. And then they prayed. A lot of us in here, we have seen God's goodness when we didn't deserve it. You ever almost feel guilty for a blessing or an answer that you got? It's like, Ugh, wow, I didn't really live up to this blessing. <laughs> and the truth is, we'll never live up to God's blessings. Because God's blessings are not rewards. They're, they're, they're gifts more than rewards. He, he, 
He blesses us even when we don't deserve it. Yes, he'll reward obedience. Yes, he'll reward faithfulness. But then there's those moments where he shouldn't even listen to us. And despite our golden calves and despite our bad decisions, he still accepts us. And that's a beautiful thing about our God. That's grace. Uh, Number three on page two. What happens when God's people pray? That's the first uh, that's the first sentence there. Because again, revival had come. And the response of the people was not only their confession, but there's that replacing that Joy talked about. There is this pledge to obey God. So they didn't just say sorry, they made a pledge to obey God no matter what. And here's some of those if-thens that I was telling you about earlier at the bottom of page two. What will God do when his people pray? Second Chronicles 7.14 is one that a lot of you know. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now again, we want forgiveness, we want God to hear us, and we want God to heal our land, but that is a call for God's people to humble themselves, to pray, and seek God's face, and to turn from our wicked ways. That's what the 20th, 21st century church needs to hear today. Acts 3.19 Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Hmm. I'm all about times of refreshing. Here's how you get it. Okay? Not necessarily at a, on a vacation or a bed and breakfast. Times of refreshing. Repent. Turn to God. Do things His way. Have your sins wiped away and give your life completely to God. That, that's when the times of refreshing come. Isn't it crazy? We, we, we make it so difficult. And God's outlined it for centuries. He's outlined it in his word. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too that God may open the door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Devote yourself to prayer. Be watchful. What does it mean to be watchful? I think we need to develop a good, healthy spiritual alertness. We need to recognize where we're weak. Can I say it again? We should recognize where we are weak and ask God to strengthen where we might be weak. That's called being watchful. When I coached, I knew where our team's weaknesses were. Uh, our point guard was terrible. Oh, that was you. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, we had a great point guard. We had a great shooting guard. We had a great forward. But then I had these big guys... I don't know they'd ever touched a basketball in their lives, in all honesty. So I had to plan our our strategy every game to compensate for our weaknesses so that we could win the game. Uh, Like, Jonathan, never pass the ball to that kid. No, I didn't say that. I'm just joking. (laughs) Uh, But I found when we came up with those strategies, we succeeded as a team. Same thing with our spiritual lives. I think some of us need to develop godly strategies to see where we are prone to weakness, to attack, where our exposed areas are, and we need to develop strength to compensate for those weaknesses. And that's going to look different probably with every single person watching and every single person in here. That's going to look different. But if we become watchful and back that up with prayer, 
that's when God will move. Let's go to the last page. There's a quote at the top of the page that I want to close with here today. Then I got to let you go. Revival starts with the church and it affects the world. Revival is getting back to the Christian life as it was meant to be lived. Maybe you want to underline that. We want revival. You got to say it that way if you really mean it. Revival. R E V A V A. Okay. First of all, what's that mean? That means we're going to have five services with the same evangelist. We'll have a tape series in the lobby and he'll wear the same suit all the time. No. No. Because you can't plan. You cannot, in fact, look, you cannot organize a revival. But you can agonize for one in prayer. You can agonize for one. I've been around God long enough to know that when he chooses to move uniquely and powerfully and differently, he typically does it when I'm not expecting it. In a way where I would not be able to say that I manufactured that, I made that happen because of my programming, because of my preaching, because of blah, blah, blah. And that's how sovereign God is. The people didn't come together and say, let's just have this massive worship festival and we're going to confess sins. And that All they did, they, come, they came together. I don't even know if Ezra was an eloquent reader, speaker, or, or not. All I know is this. Ezra stood up and he started reading the law. And people's hearts were radically changed and touched. God will move when he decides to. We do the if. He does the then. We prepare our hearts, and then God says, here you go. But all God wants to do is return the church, capital C, to what it really should be. I'm going to close with this. I told the story before, so forgive me if you've heard it before. I spoke in Africa. I was the youth speaker for all the missionary kids in Kenya and Tanzania. They all came together. And they, they all came together, and I was their speaker. And the adult speaker spoke to all the missionaries. And there was this, we, we had a meal together. We were able to get together for a meal and I asked, I said, Pastor, you know, tell me, because what had happened, his church had kind of become a hot spot, if you will, back in the 90s for a great move of God, you know, a revival, okay? I said, so, so, because I was watching him and talking to him, I thought, well, this guy's not a, he's not a kook. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Uh, you know, he's not weird. He's just a normal guy. I thought, wow, I, 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 I like this guy. And I said, Pastor, what's your, uh, what's your take on all this? And again, he said something I'll never forget. He said, here's, here's the definition of revival, Phil. Here's where the church is. Here's where the church needs to be. Revival is the trip to get there. He said, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't want to get off the ride. And they never, and they never become the church that they're supposed to be. All revival is is a vehicle in a church. All revival is is a vehicle for the church to do what it's supposed to be doing. And that will look different from congregation to congregation, from person to person. Our prayer is, God, I humble myself. I pray to you. I, I will seek your face. And God, I'm going to turn from any wickedness that's in me, any sin. I'm just going to confess it. I'm going to change. And God, you do the rest. You do what needs to be done. And that's all God needs. Again, we don't organize a move of God. We agonize for one in prayer. I'm going to pray. Speaking of prayer, and I'll let you go. All right, God, thanks. Uh, your word is so powerful, 
So many lessons to be learned here tonight. I pray that you would keep us safe as we go home. And God, if, if there's any of us, uh, we're, we're recognizing a cycle, kind of a sin cycle, kind of a, uh, uh, just a, over and over again, we're, we're making these mistakes. God, I, I pray that just as your people in chapter 9 made this, th- this decree that that's it, no more. Lord, I pray that we would have that same foundation, that same tenacity that says, God, I will, I will, I'll pursue you more than anything else. So God, I pray that as we do our part, you would fill me with your spirit and fill our church with your spirit and God, do what needs to be done. God, keep us safe as we go home. Bring us back to your house Sunday, whether it be online or in person, ready to receive from you and ready for your Holy Spirit to change us. And God, I'll thank you in your name. And we all said, amen. Amen. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, online audience, for being here. God bless you. We will see you again soon. God bless.